we've looked at the matching process and matching functions of product and labor markets. Now let's look at pricing, which is another uh, key element. Um, and here again, all the insights and lessons from the basic model are going to apply. Um, so, you know, we'll have a, a, a lot of the a lot of the discussion that we're going to have is going to mirror what we talked about in the basic model. So let's just um, summarize a few of these things and compare how pricing is going to happen on the price on the product market on the labor market. Um, let's start with the product market just because that's what's most similar to what we've done in the basic model. So what characterizes pricing on the product market? Well, we know that all prices are determined in a situation of bilateral monopoly. Um, that is, any time a firm and a household and a customer get together, there is a surplus that's created. So that's a key element. Surplus created when firm and customer match. Um, so that's key. So as a result of that, we know that there are many ways that, um, in fact, there are infinitely many ways to resolve such bilateral monopoly situation. But to do that, we've got to make an assumption about how that surplus is going to be split between the firm and uh, the customer. So uh, we need to assume, assume a price norm. And so that price norm is going to tell us that the price P is going to be given by a function price norm. And, uh, you know, in the basic model, we, we, we saw that the market tightness determines all other variables. Um, and here it's going to be the same. The market tightness, product market tightness, labor market tightness are going to determine all quantities in the model. So the most general that we can make our price norm is to make it depend on the product market tightness X and the labor market tightness theta. If your price norm depends on this, then you know it encapsulates uh, it allows for all possibilities where, in fact, your price norm may depend on other variables because at the end of the day, in the model, these other variables are going to, de to depend and are go you know, could be expressed as functions themselves of product market tightness and labor market tightness. So the most general price norm is a price that depends on the two tightnesses. So that's what we're going to assume here. We need to assume such a price norm. Uh, and once we start looking into it, what we realize is that, um, so you know, you have a bunch of price norms from a completely fixed price to a perfectly flexible price, and then everything in between that's somewhat rigid. Um, and so here, what we could uh, what we could do, and that's something in fact that we uh, we do in our paper. Um, with size on aggregate demand idle time and unemployment. So that's the paper on which this two market model is based. Um, we look at fixed price, we look at rigid prices, we look at bargain prices, we look at competitive prices. So you, can, you know you can have a look at it. But the key thing is that uh, if you assume for instance a bargain price, so if you assume that there is bargaining on the product market, what you will see is that actually following the logic of what we saw in the basic model, uh, if the price is bargained, then uh, your product market tightness is never, you know, is going to be invariant to shock. So the bargain price ends up being a flexible price. So X does not um, respond to, you know, at some level, AD and AS shocks. Okay, so you could assume a bargain price, you know, because we need to make an assumption about a price norm. 
Uh, but if you assume bargain price, the product market tightness wouldn't respond to shocks. And so, of course, in reality, we know that labor market tightness and product market tightness, um, they respond, you know, they move very much over the business cycle. We know that because we know that Slack varies very much over the business cycle, both in the labor market, you know, that's unemployment, and in the product market, that's idleness and capacity utilization. So I could assume a bargain price, but then it wouldn't be very interesting because then we wouldn't get any fluctuation in Slack. So here we would get no fluctuation in Slack over the business cycle. And so that's not interesting because here we're trying to build a realistic model of the business cycle. So we're not going to assume that. Uh, and so another thing we could do is we could have a fairly general rigid price. So that's a price that a rigid price is a price that's uh, not completely fixed. So it's a price that moves in the direction of the bargain price, but less than the bargain price. So you know, if the buying price was to go up in response to a shock, the rigid price would go up. If the bargain price was to go down, the rigid price would go down, would go down but just by a smaller amount. But by a lesser amount. Now what we know though is that if you assume a rigid price, uh, the fluctuation that you get, all the comparative statics are actually Exactly what we showed is that the comparative statics are exactly the same as if you have a fixed price. Uh, we saw that is our basic model. And this insight, uh, as we show in the paper, uh, they are also true here that if you assume a rigid price, you will get all the same insight as uh, a fixed price. So, you know, it's just not for the theoretical analysis and to understand how the model works, it's just not worth it to introduce this extra complication. Uh, So that's what you can uh, what you can show, um, and so given that you get exactly the same comparative statics, we are just going to focus on the case of a fixed price. So it's not that we cannot move to something more general that's actually not fixed but rigid, um, but the comparative statics would be the same. Uh, so we are going to just here for simplicity, uh, and given that in fact you can generate all the results with more more general uh, pricing norms that are rigid instead of fixed, given that that's doable. Here we'll just try to simplify as much as possible and we're just going to assume a fixed price. So we'll just assume that our price P is fixed and positive. Uh, okay. Uh, and in a sense, it's without too much loss of generality because you could generalize that fixed price to make it rigid and still would get all the same results that we had showed as we had showed in the paper. Um, but here, uh, let's focus on the simple case. So we have a fixed price P positive for all our services. Um, so this is our product market pricing. Um, it turns out that, of course, given the symmetric structure of the labor market, Everything's going to hold uh, true in the labor market as well. So uh, the first thing we said is that uh, there's a surplus created when the firm and the customer match. This is exactly true on the labor market as well. So we also have a situation of bilateral monopoly. And exactly the same, there is a surplus created when the firm and a job applicant meet. Why is that surplus here? Well, on the firm side, it's because once you meet a worker uh, through the matching function that's qualified, well, you've already spent all your 
uh, you've already spent a bunch of labor on the on the vacancy uh, and so if the match doesn't go through then you have to you know repost a new vacancy redevote labor to looking after that vacancy uh, and then at the end you'll get a new worker which you know in expectation is going to be exactly the same you're going to pay him exactly the same but you would have had to spend all that money paying recruiters looking after the vacancy uh, so there is a surplus here that your cost of recruit, recruiting are already sunk uh, and if you wanted to get a new uh, worker you would have to respend this recruiting cost so clearly on, on the firm side there is always a surplus on the job applicant side it's exactly the same if the match doesn't go through uh, well then you know that was your one chance to meet with the firm then you're going to be unemployed in that period and you're not going to bring any income to your household and that's going to reduce consumption so clearly the worker is better off working for the firm than being unemployed um, so clearly both sides have a surplus and so of course there's a joint surplus that has to be shared between uh, between the firm and uh, and the worker and so again you need a wage norm to determine uh, what the nominal wage is going to be um, so in the same way that you need to assume a price norm on the pro product market. A wage norm to determine um, the nominal wage. So in general, the nominal wage is going to be a wage norm. And here, similarly, the most general wage norm is going to just depend on the two tightnesses product and labor market tightness. Now, uh, right, and so something you could do exactly the same. So, and an assumption that's very typical in the matching literature is to assume that you have a bargain wage. So, you know, like say, and you have, it's very common to assume that there is bargaining over wages. It could be like Nash bargaining, or surplus sharing, that's really the standard uh, assumption. But that's, you know, as, as we know, that's not uh, that's not a useful assumption to think about business cycle, because if you're here, what we can show is that if there is bargain wedge, actually, the labor market tightness is going to not respond at all to labor demand or labor supply shock. labor demand and supply shock. So we are not going to show that uh, here in the lectures, but the logic is exactly the same as the one that uh, we've looked at when we had the basic model in which we saw that with bargain, a bargain price tightness uh, was just solely determined by the bargaining power and wouldn't respond to demand and supply shocks. Here you could do the same. You could um, solve the bargaining uh, problem between the firm and the worker. Um, you could use, for instance, surplus sharing, and then you would see that your, uh, at the end of the day, the wage would be such that uh, would be completely flexible. It would absorb all shocks, and your labor market tightness would never respond to labor demand, labor supply shock. Again, that's something that we do in the paper, uh, in our paper aggregate demand at the time and unemployment, in which we allow for bargaining, and we show that when there is a bargain wage your labor market tightness doesn't respond to shocks at all. Um, so, but you know, the, the logic we've seen it is because the bargain wedge is, uh, is perfectly flexible and absorbs all shocks. So here it's not very interesting because we know that the labor market tightness actually fluctuates a whole lot over the business cycle. Um, so instead, you know, you could also assume a rigid wedge, which as we said, you know, would be the same as a rigid price. It would be a wedge, uh, that moves in the direction of the bargain wage but uh, it moves in the direction of the bargain wage but by a lesser quantity but then what you can show and what we show in the paper is that if you assume such rigid wage all your comparative statics are actually going to be the same as if you had a, just a fixed wage.
So um, given that here we're looking for simplicity, we are not going to cover the case of the rigid wage, but that can be done. We're just going to focus on the case on the, of a fixed nominal wage. Which is positive. Uh, so that's going to be our wage norm. You just have a fixed nominal wage. Uh, so again, uh, it's without too much loss of generality because you could uh, use a rigid nominal wage and get all the same comparative statics. Um, and also, you know, of course, it's not realistic to assume that your wage is perfectly fixed. Uh, as we saw, uh, wages do move. And in particular, we saw that, uh, you know, I mean, we did see that there was a bunch of nominal freezes. So you have some uh, nominal wages that don't move for a long amount of time, but you also saw that sometimes you have, a, we saw that there were many uh, real wage freezes. So often it's real wages that don't move for a, a long amount of time. Uh, so there is a bunch of rigidity on the wage side. Um, so here we capture it by just assuming that the nominal wage is fixed. Uh, but you know you could generalize that to have uh, something that moves a little bit in a rigid way in the direction of uh, the bargain wage but less and still all your qualitative results would be the same so that's why i'm not too worried about uh, this assumption that's fairly stark of a fixed nominal wage um, so here's that's what we're going to work with we'll have a, a fixed price and a fixed uh, nominal wage so fixed nominal wage here fixed price P here. Um, and furthermore, this is also, you know, brings us back to the tradition of this old fixed price, fixed wage model of the 70s. So here you can see, we'll be able to see how our model actually, uh, with, a, with matching markets, generalize um, and really smooth out all the kinks of this old, of this old fixed price and fixed wage uh, models.